Hi, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Driver Safety, Whose Responsibility Is It? Uh, I'm Andrew Mawson, I'm Chair of Logistics and Retail Group, uh, and I'm presenting this webinar along with uh, Andy Melacrino, who's our Chair of the Irish Food and Drink Group, and Andy will introduce our guest speakers very shortly. I'm really, really pleased to be involved in this one because it's a question as a health and safety professional that I get asked a lot of time, whose responsibility is it to do X? And hopefully um, throughout the webinar, you'll find the answers that you need. Um, Andy and I will be managing questions that you are more than welcome to pose on the chat and Q&A function. They'll come through and we'll try to get through as many as we can towards the end. I'm going to hand over to Andy now, um, sat there in his executive presentation suite with that lovely looking food behind him. So over to you, Andy. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, as uh, And what we've got an interesting situation with lots of Andrews on the call. So hopefully you'll see on the, the, uh, the screens the differentiations. Um, so yes, as chair of the food and drink group, um, we are is really supporting this webinar um, because making the food, but getting the food out there to our customers and consumers, such a lot of driving involved. So we're massively supportive of this webinar. Um, I'd like to hand over now to our, our main speaker, who is Charlotte Lemaire. Charlotte is partner and regulatory head of criminal motor defence at DAC Beechcroft. So over to you, Charlotte. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy and Andrew. Um, I'd also like to introduce today um, a consultant that I'm working with closely um, at DAC Beechcroft, and that's Andrew Drury. And we're going to be presenting the um, webinar mostly together today. Um, and now I will start to just share my screen with you all. So we can get started. First of all, we want to talk to you about driving risk today. Whether you're an employee or an employer, we want you to specifically think about safety, what you have in place and what the gaps might be as we go through today. And we're going to ask a lot of questions. It's a quick tour through some of the more prominent issues that we see on a daily basis and an insight to ensure that you're doing all you can to prevent a disaster on the road. And we'll also look at the consequences when it actually does go wrong. We do do some more focused webinars on a specific subject, so it's very much a whistle-stop tour of each, of each subject. But if, you, if you're interested, then obviously you can keep an eye out for those. You will be sent a document post the webinar about our resilience product, and it's showing on the screen now. And it, is, it does what it says on the tin. It strengthens, supports, and protects fleets to, to ensure a safe, safer bottom line. It, it, it's an offering with different packages that can be tailored to your specific requirements. Um, and it gives you the support and assistance before a collision occurs through to the <coughs> cover in the event of a collision actually occurring. Helps available through policy drafting, audits, gap analysis, training, and just general collision investigation, and essentially helping with running the areas of fleet management. Now we are gonna show a series of videos today. Um, there are a lot of attendees and it does depend on your bandwidth as to how these come through. So we do know that some of them may be a little stuttery, bear with us. Um, you will still get the message from it um, and the sound should still be okay, but obviously just, let, just post something in the chat box if something, something isn't working. There are also many polling questions and we'd encourage you to get involved. It's an interactive session in so much as it can be when we're virtual. Um, and we'd encourage you to get involved um, and, and and uh, answer those polling questions because they are, really are quite interesting. So we're going to move on to the first video. Um, how safe are you drivers? Just have a little look at this one. Just to advise everyone, there's no sound on this video, so don't worry.
sure some of you have just taken a bit of a, an intake of breath with with that image. As you can see, this guy is uh, very, very lucky, and it's only when you see it in slow motion that you get an idea of how far over the solid white line this other vehicle is. And we were obviously lucky enough to get th these images because of all the, the cams around the vehicle. The thing what comes up here at the end in this last stat is, is probably more important to everybody here today who drives for work or who has employees who drive for work. This guy had a blowout on the road and if you checked his vehicle properly, there's a good chance he may uh, have identified a problem with the tyre. But the recovery agents who attend the breakdowns, uh, since two, year 2000, over 800 are killed or seriously injured each year attending a live breakdown. Uh, so think about the condition of your vehicles before you go out uh, to consider the, in, the problems you may put other people attending the, the incidents on the road as well. So just a, a nice introduction for you. So our first polling question, I'd just like everybody to, uh, to cast their vote. In the event of a breakdown, have you provided training to your drivers so they know what to do? Would it be yes or no, all vote now? Yes, 63%, no, 38%. So a, a, a reasonably uh, good, good result, but not quite, probably quite where you'd want to be. You'd want to be much more near 100%, but obviously that's, that's fantastic to know that these people are really considering this and being honest about what, what, where the position is. So we move on. How big a problem is driving? Let's just have a look at some of these. I'm going to read them all out to you. I know that you can all read, but if we have a look at this, the total for tube, tram, aviation, rail deaths, water deaths, homeless deaths, homicide deaths, 1,840. 1,837 road deaths alone. That's five people roughly every day and 30% are work related. That just gives you a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a taster as to the real risks involved with driving. Put it simply, that's the equivalent of a plane crashing every six weeks and it's something we don't think about it's something we do every single day but driving is one of the most dangerous activities any of us will ever do and it's one of the most dangerous activities we can ask any of our employees to do and that's why it's so important to try and get things right from the beginning because accidents will always happen but some of them and a lot a lot of them are preventable so andrew is going to take you through the next slide You're on mute, Andrew. You just flick through them all, Charles, and bring them up. You all, got, all of you guys know from a health and safety perspective the, the moral, economic and legal reasons of why we need to, to manage work-related road risk, um, mainly for your duty of care for a safe working environment. But again, because driving, there are is 45 million driving license holders out there, and it's something most of us do on a daily basis. We don't really think about driving hence why we're doing this, this session today, but something that needs to be reaffirmed and, and refocused with staff all the way through. So we've got the reasons to do it. And also for those of us who are running commercial fleets, you have your regulatory obligations as well, uh, and not just safety legislation. I think it's more paramount now, given the change of, or well, the test case earlier this year, for the prosecution under health and safety legislation for driver fatigue deaths uh, in an instance seven years ago. So these are the reasons why we need to consider change. So I think um, speeding and, and has obsession in more detail, mobile phones um, and any other avoidable distractions, alcohol, drugs, health and medical conditions, and the policies and procedures surrounding it. And then it, it, you'll notice that at the end of each kind of section, we have a consequences and penalties slide. I'm not going to go into the consequences of penalties of each one because actually they're pretty similar. If a disaster happens following any of the above, the consequences and penalties could well be very similar, but it's just a kind of, it follows a format and you'll see that throughout. So it's another polling question. So you can see the questions on the screen. When was the last time you read the highway code? Um, so we can, uh, within the last 12 months, within the last three years, within the last 10 years, or never since passing your driving test. So if we do that one and then follow on and do the others. And hopefully we can uh, just get those results straight after you've answered those questions. 
couple of slides on, we'll look at that, Charlotte, and the, the, the answers. So whilst those are being generated, let's have a look at this video again. I'm sorry if it buffers a little bit, but hopefully you'll get the point and the sound will come through properly. So sorry, I thought there was time. He just pulled out. I don't have time to stop. Well, come on, mate. It was a simple mistake. I don't know if I was going a bit slower. Please. I've got my boy in the back. I'm going too fast. I'm sorry. Okay, so that really makes you think. Um, hopefully it came through okay for, for most of you. Um, but there, people are always going to make mistakes on the road, so it's something to really think about. So let's look. When was the last time you read the highway code? So we've got 23% within the last 12 months, within the last three years, 27. Never since passing the driving test, 35. So that's most people, Andrew, and that's generally what we'd, we'd expect to actually see in a lot of the webinars that we do, isn't it? It's, it certainly is, uh, and those figures have been pretty static for the last four or five years from these questions that we've been asking. And how often do you get to read the highway code? Never 51%. And again, that, that is, it, it's, it, it's very similar. When we're, whenever we deliver these seminars, it's, it, it, it's, it's pretty much the same. And how many vehicles are on the UK roads? We'll go through that, that answer uh, answer in a second when we go to the next slide but it's it but it's it's uh it's very interesting to see and not uncommon at all right so we've already done the answers but uh how many vehicles on the uk roads and if you'll take us through the answers andrew so if you want to bring them up now charlotte please so September 2019, just to over 40 million vehicles. That's 100% increase on 1980. So in 39 years, there's 100% more vehicles on the road, but actual road space is probably only increased by about 15% in that time. And no surprise, cars are the main um, category here, but I think ones that people are really surprised with are the, the volume of HGVs and buses and coaches. We expect there to be a lot more, most people expect to, that number to be a lot more because of the size of the vehicles. And when you're on the motorway, you see five or six vehicles together in a, in a slight convoy. But in fact, there's, not, there's only just about 500,000 HGVs on the roads in the UK and only 162,000 buses and coaches. So it gives you something to think about on the, on the perception of vehicle, vehicles on the road when we're out there. But I think we'd all agree post lockdown um, you know, there will have been a lot of vehicles. So what we're going to look at first is, is speeding. And you can see, you know, how, how big a problem is speeding. But you can see, you can see on that slide there that, you know, 2.1 million speeding offences. Um, so equates to 85% of all motoring offences. I mean, that's huge. But actually, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't really signify the problem because how many times do we actually all get away with speeding and nothing actually happens? Um, but you can see there that, you know, do you know what your drivers are doing? You know, if you have tracking or, or, or tacos or things like that on your vehicle, are they checked? Are they monitored? Are they recorded? Do you have a speeding policy? Is it enforced? Is it policed? Do the drivers know what it is? And is it implemented? Is it managed? Because what we always say is great if you've got the policy in the first place that's, that, that, that may be considered bulletproof. Some don't, but if you have, that's fantastic. But if, if you do, it's no good having this brand new, shiny, wonderful policy if nothing's actually done with it. So if, if it, it can't be shown, drivers are shown it, that they understand it, that they've signed it, they've agreed to it and signed up to it. And that actually, if they're breaching it regularly, even once, that they're spoken to and that, that something is followed up. Because otherwise, you leave the company vulnerable. So driver vulnerable on the road. Andrew, what have you got to add to that? So just on, uh, my main point here is on society. Those of us who work in, in, in customer facing roles and, and businesses, 
Uh, and we know from uh, what's gone on in, in lockdown that transport sector is, is vital to what we do every day. The main thing here is home deliveries. We live in a society where we want everything delivered yesterday. Uh, look at the home delivery services. We order today. We could have it by 10 o'clock this evening if we wanted. We have to think what we're asking our employees to do. But we also have to think as individuals from society what we're asking employers and drivers to do on a daily basis. Do we really need that item ordered today at 12.48 by 10 o'clock this evening? If we do, then you make run the risk that you're asking people to 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 knowingly speed while they're out making deliveries to your house today. So it's just something to think about. As an employer, you just need to think yourself about what you're asking your drivers to do and what your policy is on that. Because we have many cases where drivers will will turn around and say, "But my employer expected me to be there by a certain time." So it's just something to think about on on, on speeding, and um, because we know how catastrophic it can be. And of course. The first consequence of the penalty slide I will go through and um, the rest will be very similar but if something happens in, in the course of somebody um, breaking the speed limit um, and a, a death or a serious injury or something like that happens then you know clearly we're looking at the offences of either causing death by dangerous driving and probably if there's excessive speed it probably will be dangerous you might get away with causing death by careless driving but even then, both carry custodial sentences, which is huge for somebody who's never been involved in the law with the law previously, somebody who has never been in trouble at all before. Um, they find themselves in prison for speeding, which actually a lot of us in society, um, I'm not going to say it's widely accepted, but it is done. Now, that's the consequence for the driver. Even if they don't go to prison, say, say if, if it's a more minor injury, then there's the fine, the points and the ban to think about. Um, which of course, if you're a professional driver or, or, or even if you drive for a living, um, how does that affect you? How does it affect your employment? Um, losing your job, losing your home, those kinds of things, insurance considerations. And then for the company, you know, if one of your drivers is prosecuted, it's not necessarily a get out of jail free card for the company. If those policies are not in place and they're not policed and they're not implemented properly or followed, then the company's liable to prosecution too. Um, and the health and safety executive will be crawling all over the company, as will the police in the initial period. And of course, we didn't forget that it can mean imprisonment for directors. Um, it can also mean unlimited fines. There's remedial, remedial orders and, of course, the publicity, um, you know, the media, the unwanted media attention. And of course, all of that then affects the company's bottom line. So the, the consequences, both personal and for the company, are absolutely huge. Um, and like I say, this follows for absolutely everything we're going to talk about, but it's just something you need to think about because driving, just something we do every single day, can mean disaster if we don't have um, the right things in place and if we don't think about things properly. So let's go to our next polling question. Mobile phones, that's the biggie, isn't it, in the news? So how often you use your mobile phone? And honesty, please, we're not going to do anything with this. Um, have you ever used it or how often do you use it? Have you ever held or used your mobile phone while stationary with the engine running? That's an interesting one. And who has called an employee or a colleague or even a family member actually, knowing that they are driving? And we're talking about even hands-free here, guys. So uh, give, give it a vote. So we'll get those, uh, the answers to those. But before we do, we'll just watch this quick video. So I'll play it while getting those. That's it, that's it, that's it, yeah. No, I'm going to get up work tomorrow. Come on. So he goes, all right, I'll go up the pole. So he goes, I'll go up the pole, how much? Right. And Leo's gone, 100 quid. Right. 100 quid to go up. Come on. Touch my hair. Seatbelt. Yes. So Leo, so he's only got his, his pants and his bow tie on it, and he just starts to climb it. And the lights go on, and, and everyone's looking. And... I think I should drive. Yeah, what was I thinking? I just got to get this text off. I'm turn to drive. Good, good driver. Right. Oh, I think I should drive. So that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Let's have a look at this poll first, though. So this isn't as bad as we've had, Andrew, is it? But how often do you use your mobile phone? 
never 23 percent if someone calls us 46 so i suppose we'd say we're not as much in control of that wouldn't we unless of course what could we do put it on do not disturb and in the glove box have you ever held your mobile phone 79 percent well at least you're honest and i think a lot of us would say that that is still an offense even if you're stationary if you've got an intent to drive you're sat behind the wheel andrew will confirm that that is an offense who has called an employee or colleague knowing they are driving and 61% yes. Well, that is pretty much as we expected, isn't it, Andrew? You're on mute, Andrew, there. I think so. I think it's it, it pretty consistent. I think it just goes to show how reliant we are on phones for business and uh, our, our everyday living. I think one of the biggest things here, yes, using a mobile phone when you're stationary in traffic, we've all seen people pull over to the side of the road, engine running, look at the phone but they think they're doing the right thing because they're not moving this is where coming down to understanding the legislation is vitally important um, and it's the interpretation of the legislation that put, lets a lot of people down basically the one rule of thumb to look at is if you're sat in the car in the driver's seat with the key in your hand whether the key is in the ignition or not you're deemed to be in control of the vehicle hence if you pick up your phone while you're in that position you're committing an offence it's entirely up to you how good your defence solicitor is to argue that point if you if prosecution uh, follows or attempted prosecution follows. So just bear in mind what the actual legislation is and what you need to get across to your staff when you're training them on the, them on the I, legislation. I, and to finish that, I, I am good, but I'm not, I'm not good enough to get you off because that's essentially an offence if you sat there doing that, that is an offence. Now, it, the, the other thing you have to think about, and it's a question we're often asked and we might discuss it a bit more at the end is, well, hang on a minute, hands-free isn't illegal. It's not illegal. But if something happens, even while you're on the phone hands-free, it is considered to be an avoidable distraction. They get you always round and that if something happens, that is dangerous driving, whether or not you are hands-free. So you just need to bear in mind, what's your policy? I'm not asking you to vote now, but you know, what, is, what is your policy on mobile phones as a company? Do you, do you expect drivers to, to, to answer them? Do you have a policy on it? Do you, do you say anything at all? And you've just got to think about that because as it says there, you're more likely to have a, to have a crash while you're texting and driving than, than drunk behind the wheel, which might surprise some of you. So we'll move on. So we've already had a look at the polling. So we'll have a look now at driving whilst distracted. There's another video here. In 500 meters, turn right. two seconds at 50 kilometers an hour you'll travel 27 meters blind as somebody somebody has already pointed out earlier in the q a that australia and new zealand do some really hard hitting videos because uh, over here in the uk we're a bit too afraid to, of offending people these days but we need to see things in real life i think if each one of those incidents in that video there was a different distraction all the way through uh, one was just picking up his phone to look at the sat nav one was te the, the phone text going with uh, music on in the background and then the last distraction so distractions are leading to disaster i think if we move on to the next slide charlotte we can explain that a, li a little bit more detail if you bring all the all the incidents up the information because i'm conscious of time um at the minute so real devastation this is a recent uh, prosecution only prosecuted last month uh, for an incident not far from where i live in merseyside bright clear day warning signs of a lane closure and exit uh, at the exit and traffic building up Driver had only been on his phone for 30 minutes, but in that journey time from his depot to where the collision took place, he'd been texting his mother and BBC Radio 1, speaking to his partner, playing a fantasy game, Hustle Castle, whatever that is, that's news to me, Sky News, Sports News and Facebook. And his excuse when he was initially investigated, asked what had happened, I'd only taken my eyes off the road for a second. Uh, tell that to the family uh, of, the, of the two victims and the five uh, people who were seriously injured as part of this incident so again it's it's there for in plain daylight for everybody to see what the consequences are if we move on charlotte 
Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure everybody can see that. And if you just have a look at there, just flicking through, look how many serious and, and fatal collisions. Um, this is 2018 data, but, but it'll be similar for, for the last couple of years um, due to mobile phone use. It, it's absolutely horrifying. Um, and this is what you need to look at. Do your drivers know the legislation? Do you know it? Do you have a separate policy? What does the policy say? And again, the all important question, is it implemented and managed? Consequences and penalties, I've gone through it and I'm conscious of time, but I think the consequences are fairly obvious looking at the last slide. So alcohol and driving, this is another massive issue. Let's get the polling questions going. Which month of the year you must like to get caught? This will be interesting to see whether people know this. How often do you test your drivers? And have you asked any of your drivers if they have an alcohol or drug problem? So we'll just watch this video while we're doing the polling question or whilst we're getting the results. Malcolm has recently been promoted to CEO of Photocopy. Have you seen how well he's doing? Yesterday, he was on a night out with his regional manager, Derek. They were bonding. Suddenly, Derek handed Malcolm a drink. A big shot from a big gun. But Malcolm had already had one. I'm, I'm driving, he said. And a second drink won't matter. No, sorry, said Malcolm. <laughs> no, no, I'm the one who's sorry, lad, said his regional manager. <laughs> Malcolm's been sent to Siberia. Return date, TBC. Photocopying. But alive. Charlotte, can I just raise a, a point here from uh, just one of the questions about should we be blanking out names off on some of the slides of vehicles involved? All the vehicles, all the information that we're using in the video in the webinar today is in the public domain and has been freely uh, published in, in the press since the incidents have happened and post uh, prosecution. So they're not affecting any potential prosecutions that are going on at this time. They're not, they're not ongoing cases, guys, don't worry. Uh, it's public domain once somebody's prosecuted. Um, right, so that's the polling questions. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if you quickly want to take us through those. Uh, bit, of a, bit of a trick question, this one. Uh, up until probably last year, May was the most common month for drink driving and drug driving offences. This is mainly down to the three bank holidays coming in quick succession at the start of the spring summer months. You have Easter and then we have the two May bank holidays. However, over 2019, early 2020, the split is pretty much quite even across the board now on months of the year that uh, you, you can be caught drink driving because drug driving offences this year are actually up 400% uh, on 2019 already. So just something to think about. So yeah, hopefully everybody can see those there, but um, you know, it, it just does get the, uh, the, the brain thinking about it, you know, how are you testing for these things? Um, and, and, and are you speaking to your drivers about what their habits or problems might be, if anything? I think that the last question there is, it's quite a good split that. There's more people after starting to ask the questions about uh, health issues with drivers now. Um, I think in this day and age, it's something to be wary of, particularly um, in respect of uh, lockdown and the issues that people are going through and people taking more drugs, allegedly taking more drugs and, and alcohol and drinking alcohol. So from a well-being perspective, have a, a, a plan in place in your policy for self-reporting uh, and deal with it that way as well and encourage self-reporting. Do you want to do this one as well, Andrew, just quickly? Um, yeah, this one, an old one again, three years old now. But again, this guy had been uh, twice the legal limit, stopped in the live lane of the, of the M1 uh, between the on and off slip roads, uh, junction 15 and he'd been stationary for 10 minutes, uh, fallen asleep, and then got hit in the back, uh, sandwiching uh, a minibus with eight passengers in, inside it as well, or 12 passengers inside it. I think also, again, on this issue, whose responsibility was it to check his driving licence was still valid as it was revoked 37 days before the incident? That's what you've got to think. Whose responsibility, who, who does that, who does that, you know, stand with? So just another quick video to play. This is the morning after, so Andrew will take you through it once we've had a play of it. 
So just look at the date and the date and the time here coming up at Christmas 2016 at 25 to 12 in the morning. This lady is doing over 50 miles an hour as she hits the roundabout and actually flies over the roundabout and you'll see from the debris on the road where she actually impacts on the road. Of course part of the investigation she's actually travelled over 35 metres in the air before hitting the road and as the vehicle comes round where we've captured this these images you'll see what the uh, the vehicle is on its roof and is looking from the road markings there is almost 35 metres further down the road. Fortunately, the driver came out with hardly any injuries. She also had a, a three-month-old baby in the back seat in a child car, in a child seat. Baby came out with no injuries as well. Um, it's so, always yeah. always worth remembering the morning after. Um, you've still got to be careful about what you might have had the night before, and obviously, um, what are you ask what are you asking your drivers to do the next day following maybe a work meeting, a dinner, an awards, but what, whatever you might be asking um, your colleagues, not you know your employees anybody to do um the, the next day um you know are they in a rush to go anywhere you can see what happened there so none for the road is the only answer and you can see some statistics there um but you know again do your drivers know the limits um you can be over the limit not impaired under the limit impaired and both of those things are illegal do you have a policy do your drivers know what it is and how is it implemented and managed and you'll see a pattern forming here hopefully some food for thought for you and again, consequences and penalties speak for themselves. Just, just go back to consequences, uh, Charlotte, on this one. Just one thing to add here, and the same for drugs. To have a drug conviction, drink conviction in this country can restrict travel for you going forward. So think about, particularly going to the States, so think about your, your, your children's friends all going to America, and then you say you can't go because you've got a drink or drug um, conviction and you can't get a visa to go in so think about the consequences in that respect from a personal point of view okay another polling question here so if we can get that going um how many drugs are illegal to take while driving do you implement a pre-employment drug alcohol policy and how often do you reaffirm it so uh let's have a look at what the uh answers are in a second but before we do why don't we watch this short video Interesting point here, Charlotte, on some of the, the questions. Uh, my CAO didn't think it was necessary to include himself in the list of employees who should be su subjected to drug and alcohol testing. Couldn't disagree more, Mike. Uh, it should be led from the top down. Uh, and a yeah. number, number of times we've done implemented new drug and alcohol testing, the first thing we do is go into the boardroom on at a board meeting unannounced and test all, all the board. So employee uh, um, the employers uh, business owners should always be part of the process as well and for a start setting an example for the rest of the company if they're not doing it how if you're not leading from the top how can you expect people to follow so they're, they're the polling questions there um interesting split there andrew yeah 17 17 is the right answer there's uh, eight illegal drugs and nine legal prescribed drugs uh, that can stop you from driving do you implement a pre uh, the testing policy, employment testing policy, pretty what I'd expect, but it's a good thing to do. Solve the problem before it starts. A uh, number of people we've introduced it to, they have a 30% dropout of uh, people turning up for interviews because they know they could get tested. So it stops, the pro it stops the problem before it starts. And how often do you reaffirm it? My advice would be twice a year. When the hour goes on in the, in the summer, before the summer months start, and when the hour goes back in the winter before we come into the Christmas period, it's a good time to re re reinforce your policy. Not only are you, are you helping with the safety um, issue, um, but you, you, you're also protecting yourself as a company as well and protecting your drivers. Um, so let's move on. So, Andrew, do you want to take them through this quickly? Uh, just a very quick one. Just shows how old the problem is. We've talked, we've been talking about these issues for a long time uh, with driving, but 2014, six years ago. Fortunately, the car that you can see just about between the two vehicles 
Yeah, the lady walked away with hardly any injuries somehow, uh, but the driver had no indication that the vehicle was stationed. The vehicles in front of him were stationary, despite having a clear road for 300 metres in front of him. But he was twice over the uh, the alcohol, the, the legal limit in that respect. So just a few stats for you there as well. Um, and again, it's just the same thing. Do you, have you got a separate drug policy? It shouldn't really be rolled into your alcohol policy. It should be separate because, of course, we're not just talking about illegal drugs. We're talking about legal drugs. There are an awful lot that you can and can't take whilst you're driving. You just, you just need to have that set out. Do your drivers know what it is? How is it implemented and managed? Is it even implemented and managed? And you just really need to take, take a lot of care when you're looking at that. So just one point on legal drugs. Uh, the, the, and, and the, fail, the drug failure test, could you, could you lose and run as a business with 30% of your drivers uh, on drugs and if they all failed the test on the same day, what would that do to the business? Legal drugs, make sure you take them as prescribed. You may decide to take one extra uh, painkiller on the day and take five instead of four, that would take it over the limit and you're not taking it in the prescribed manner so it could lead you into prosecution. Absolutely. And again, consequences and penalties, and it doesn't need to be said, but actually when we're talking about drugs and alcohol, um, generally there is a view in, in court that, and, and by most judges, that actually this is, this is almost a, a deliberate flag, flagrant and dis disregard of the rules, and therefore the penalties are, are huge um, if something happens, um, if you're intoxicated in, in, either, in either manner. Um, so it's uh, something that you need to take into account. And of course, you know, reputationally for a, for a company, that, that's pretty disastrous as well. Uh, good point here from uh, Kieran uh, Delaney, Charlotte, saying about loose items being in the vehicles as well. Again, that is a big issue, as, it, as Kieran said, about uh, cans of drinks getting stuck under the pedals to stop you keeping control of the vehicle. Again, it all comes down to what you should and shouldn't do and, and how you have the setup of the vehicle before you, you go out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what you've got to think is it's not just, you know, the things we're pointing out, but anything that can be a distraction or danger within the vehicle, if, if you know, if, if that's within your control, then absolutely it's a huge issue. Let's go on to our health conditions, because this is something that is, is, is another huge issue that we see. So we'll start our polling again. How often uh, do, you, do you, should it say, and your drivers have an eye test? Um, how many medical conditions can stop you from driving? And how many medical conditions are reportable to the DVLA? This is often something that uh, catches people out. And we'll just uh, watch this uh, video whilst we're just collating those results. Tonight, John will die in his sleep. He's warm, comfortable, and has his family by his side. Video, some as you can tell by some of them, but still a very valid message in this day and age. I think, particularly people going back out to driving to drive after um, COVID and lockdown issues re implement. Driving is a bit more difficult now than it probably ever has been. So, uh, just think about what we're asking staff to so, do, particularly if they're doing double shifts and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, tiredness I come across an awful lot. Um, and actually, the people prosecuted for causing death by dangerous driving who fall asleep behind the wheel, um, they are the, the overworked company directors um, who are going to prison for an awful long time. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a boy racer. And driving through the village at 100 miles an hour, driving tired is a huge problem. And it's something probably most of us do, actually, um, because we feel as though we need to. But looking at the polling. Polls? Right, polls. Every 12 months, I would suggest is I get all my drivers in the past to do a, a, have an, a, an official eye test every 12 months. But I would suggest you also do an eyesight check yourself from 22 metres every six months, just so you can test them on the spot. How many medical conditions can stop you from driving? Yeah, there's over 22. So it's good that that amount has increased from the last time uh, uh, we asked these questions. So there are a number of them. I think there's about 28 now. There's been a few added in the last six months or so. So make sure you're aware of which the, which ones they are. And how many conditions are reportable to DVLA? There's over 170. I think it's almost up to 195 now. So for those of us in class one license, just motorcycle and car, 
there's 164 medical conditions reportable to DVLA, of which 112 are mandatory. And for commercial vehicle drivers, there's over 100, over, there's 191, I think, mandatory reportable medical conditions. Mandatory, doesn't matter whether it affects your driving ability or not, they are reportable if you have them. So think about it, they don't have to affect your driving ability. They are mandatory Ooh. reportable. And ignorance is not a defence. So if you don't know about it, you can't say, oh, well, I just didn't know, so it's okay. It's not okay. Um, you need to know about it. Your drivers need to know about it. And they need to be telling you about it as well. So do you ask them? Do you have a fitness to drive policy? Do you check it? Do your drivers know where it is? Um, do you implement it and do you manage it? Because it's a huge task, isn't it? Depending how the size of the fleet or the grey fleet or whatever. Because we're not just talking about commercial vehicles here. We're talking about grey fleet as well. Because that's actually more poorly managed, we tend to find. Because, of course, it's less regulated in general. Um, so there you have it there. Your insurer needs to know about these things. Consequences of penalties, again, speak for themselves. You'll be seeing a pattern emerging here. They're all the same. So, so. Just, to, just to sum up, these are the basic learnings from today. I think the biggest ones to, to, to look at is make sure you, you have a, a good training policy, embed and implement your policies properly and robustly, and risks continue to change. We've seen that this year in particular. But for an employer, private life is an employer risk. And vice versa, an employer risk is also an, an employer life, and employee life is, is a private risk as well. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we have both have responsibility. It is the driver and the, and the employer responsible at all times for drivers uh, when they're out on the road. And I think something Charles and I are working on in particular is have a disaster plan in place for when, the, when a catastrophe does happen because at some point it will happen given the fact okay. that there's 100,000 near misses for every fatality in this country so think about that as you, as you manage your fleets. Don't wait for something to happen don't think that we've always been okay so it doesn't matter we haven't had anything yet chances are you will and if you don't have anything in place you almost certainly will um, and if you do need help with that you need to reach out and um, because try managing fleets Grey fleets, large fleets, small fleets, it doesn't matter. It's a huge job. It's a huge task to do it properly. We'd, we'd finally, we'd just like you to watch this video and play, pay real close attention to this last video we're going to show you. Um, I think it really, really hits home.
hopefully that came across to you all. Um, I think it's certainly really hard hitting. And I think we're probably uh, just about uh, running out of, um, of, of our, our, our time. And uh, that's great because we've uh, finished our presenting um, section of the webinar. Um, but I know or I think there will be um, some questions um, or comments that we've missed. And we're absolutely happy to open up the discussion and have a chat with you all. So um, thank you, Andrew Drury. But uh, Andy and Andrew, I shall, uh, I shall I'll let you into the conversation now. Okay, thank you, Charlotte, um, and thank you, Charlotte and Andrew, for that uh, really impacting webinar. Um, for me, it certainly makes us think, and it reminds us of the risk. And you're right that we all—it's one of the most dangerous things we all do. And those videos were certainly very impacting. Um, we've got about ten minutes for um, questions. We've got quite a few questions come through, so I'll start um, by asking the first uh, first question. So. Um, many organisations have disciplinary procedures for commercial vehicle drivers who speed. However, when managers or senior managers are caught speeding, no action is taken. A culture of acceptability. So should companies be consistent? Absolutely. There's, there's, that, there's only one answer to that, because as we've said, um, this starts at the top and those people are not going to be um, absolved of any responsibility or indeed not liable for prosecution. I think that's, you know, it absolutely should be the same culture, top to bottom, whatever vehicle you're driving. And I know, Andrew, you'd agree with me on that. I would. And I think just to probably highlight the point even more is most, most companies that I've dealt with over the years don't change until the CEO is prosecuted for a driving offence. And that, I think that's the worrying thing. It is an, a, a culture of acceptance until it happens to them. Uh, so it does, it does work in reverse as well, Andy, if that helps. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question. Do any companies use the highway code as part of the induction process or, or during an assessment? Uh, yes, is the easy answer to that. It's. It's something I put into induction courses all the time. Um, it's easy to do now. I'm encouraging people to, to as part of the induction, to use the, the ability online to, to take a mock driving theory test. Because in my day, 38, 39 years ago, when I passed the test, the theory test wasn't there. It was six lessons, you passed your test, and that was it. So it wouldn't do any harm for you to get your drivers to sit the theory test every year because that will make you think about the way you're driving again. Uh, so 50 quick multiple choice questions and takes about 20 minutes, half an hour. And it's a well worth exercise. Okay, thank you for that. Um, how, would you, how would you view sat-nav systems, many of which are now standard equipment fitted on vehicles? Should they be considered as a distraction? They are absolutely a distraction. Of course, um, that with the modern day vehicle, that's supposed to make a lot easier for us. And of course, um, in many ways they do. They also bring with them far, many, far more distractions. Um, yes, you can use your sat-nav. That's not illegal. Of course it's not, it's in the vehicle. But actually, if you're using it and you are distracted and something happens, it's an avoidable distraction. You'll be prosecuted off the back of it. And so it's also something to take into account. Um, that's not to say don't use them. We all do. But you've got to be very careful. It's like changing a CD or say CD. How old am I? But, you know, changing your radio station, changing your downloads or whatever you've got on your on your on your uh, entertainment system. It's all the same. It's not illegal. But you but you can be prosecuted as a result if you are distracted and if the court can prove that you are and there's an awful lot of information they can get. So sat navs are absolutely an avoidable distraction, something to really, really consider. Just to, just to clarify that point a bit, I think, Andy, as well, for most people, when we talk about in-vehicle technology these days, most people think about telematics and camera systems um, that people fit retrospectively. The modern vehicle, even for those of us driving company cars or our own vehicles for Great Fleet, the modern vehicles now have up to, some of them have up to 70 little engine management systems now, all recording data about various things. Your infotainment system records every time you touch a button on that system, when you're driving or when you're stationary. So for me as an investigator, I can, get, I can download all the information of the vehicle with a tool that I have 
it takes about 20 minutes to get all the data about how often you put your indicator on, when did you put your lights on, when did you turn your ignition on, when did you put your foot on the brake, when did you start changing lanes after or allegedly putting your indicator on. We can find anything out about the way the vehicle is driven now without even speaking to the driver. And in most serious cases, we would do that first before we actually interview the driver to get a credibility aspect from the driver when we interview them. Okay, that was a uh, very, very helpful answers. Thank you. Um, next question, really interesting one. If a child who's left unattended runs into the road and is hit by a moving truck, will the driver be prosecuted? Um, from the speed limiter installed on the truck, he was not over speeding. How could such be prevented? So that the, the answer to that is it depends. So if a driver is abiding by the speed limit that's great that's one thing and um, the other thing to remember is if they're driving at an appropriate speed within the speed limit because of course if, if there's a speed limit of 30 and you're, you're driving at 29 but actually it's a really built up area and you've got cars on either side of the road 29 is an inappropriate speed even though it's a legal speed so you have to take that into account really what it comes down to is could the driver have seen and reacted to that hazard whatever that hazard is if they could and a reasonable or competent careful driver could have done then the likelihood is they would be prosecuted regardless of whatever speed they were traveling of course if it's found through collision investigation which of course we'd have an expert look at that actually reasonably there's no way they could have reacted to an unexpected hazard running straight out in front of them and they couldn't have stopped then they, they wouldn't be. So the answer to that is it, it does depend, but but being within the speed limit doesn't necessarily save you, if that makes sense. And just okay. a, an additional point on that, given the fact that we've got a highway code consultation ongoing at the minute, which ends on the 27th of October, if people want to go onto the government's website to have their say, there is a suggestion of a hierarchy of road users and that those in the bigger vehicles will almost automatically be held culpable for incidents that's the way people are reading it whether that's right or not is it will be down to the consultation so it's always been deemed that the bigger the vehicle the more likely you are to cause damage and so the more responsible you are so mm -hmm. that helps with that question as well okay thank you for that i do i do just want to say Andy, i know there might be some more questions but there'll probably be a lawful lot of questions and i don't mind being contacted by anyone if you want to have a chat about this or you want more information so i want to say that just now anyway yeah we have we have got quite a lot of questions coming through and and i'm sure that those questions could be collated and and provided to you to 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 provide the answers that would be really helpful absolutely no problem. um in the last few minutes um so have drug drug and alcohol prosecutions increased um a minute sorry i just lost that question just type here have drug and alcohol prosecutions increased due to the increased testing mm, good question now, I can align you on some recent information that's come out that I've, I've been uh, given uh, in the last week or so. Test, roadside testing failures are going up and almost 400% up this year. The problem is getting the laboratory to carry out the test. So the police are make, having more tests at the roadside, but they're not getting the laboratory tests conducted because there is a delay in the system. So that might have a delay in the number of prosecutions. So the figures are, could, could well be a bit skewed this year, but that's, that's something out of the police's control. It, it's it's the, the testing system. And there was a big issue over a company two or three years ago, making errors on the testing and that's had a knock on effect and is still having the knock on effect now. So the police are only prosecuting as many as they can at this moment in time from getting the right results back. Overall, of course, we're the tip of the iceberg, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Um, we may have time for a couple more. So um, why don't we have a zero alcohol limit in this country? <laughs> why don't we indeed? That's, a, that's what we all think in the industry, isn't it, Andrew? <laughs> well, it's very, very difficult. So there have been people prosecuted for having Granny's sherry, sherry trifle at Christmas because of the amount of sherry she's put into it. But also the body creates alcohol itself through different chemical reactions. So you could not drink any alcohol or you could use mouthwash and that could take you over the limit. Let's look at 
as a great example last week, the Oxford Oxford United bus going to a match last Saturday, the dry after they sprayed the coach with with disinfectant so all the players could get onto it with the alcohol and disinfectant. The immobilizer that was fitted to the coach wouldn't let the coach start because of the alcohol limit in the air. Mm. So you have to think about could you really honestly put a a zero tolerance alcohol um, system in place in this country with alcohol no because of what happens within your what you but what you could do is you could bring it down to the point where it would it it wouldn't necessarily impact having those small things but you could be brought down further to be effectively an awful lot lower i think which would help okay really really interesting questions and helpful answers thank you um in my organization, we have transport managers at our distribution centers. They don't hold a transport manager's CPC, so they believe they are untouchable. If anything happens, is this the case? <laughs> well, they can't be called transport managers if they don't have a CPC. Simple as. So that's, they're not transport managers. They are just managers. So under health and safety legislation, what's the manager's responsibility? They have a duty of care to all employees, so they're not untouchable. Absolutely not. And, and I, I, you know, that's something that I think uh, probably needs to be looked at. Where does the responsibility for driver safety sit with the transport team or the safety team? Both. Both, yeah. <laughs> Both. It, it sits with the company and effectively anybody that can have control over that. So health and safety, absolutely. The, it's, it's, in, it's in the title. Um, they need to be working with the transport team and, and, and they need to have the procedures in place just in general. So it, it does sit with, with both. Well, just a, an addition to that though, Andy, um, I did notice the question earlier on today saying, what's our view on health and safety stats not including road deaths as part of workplace deaths? It is a big gripe of mine. Um, it should be just be a vehicle is not classed as a place of work by the health and safety. It's only classed as a place of work when it's on a depot in a car park or on private land within the own that the business own. That's why last year there was only 24 transport recorded deaths to the health and safety that happened on workplace premises where we had over 600 deaths on the actual road on public highway. So for me, health and safety goes a certain way i would suggest for companies they should have a fleet risk department and a, a fleet a fleet department and a health and safety department that run but health and safety oversee but they sort of run hand in hand because the risks are very different and you guys from is will probably understand that but a lot of the health and safety legislation doesn't come into the fleet risk management side of things so i would have two separate teams that health and safety have the ultimate responsibility for but fleet is managed very differently to general health and safety legislation but ultimately the responsibility is uh, the owner or director of that company mm. that's okay. who will be in the dock okay thank you andrew um very practical um a couple of very uh, similar questions um you mentioned earlier in your presentation about reportable conditions and medical conditions so where can we see all the conditions reportable to the dvla um, and and there's the, the another question was the current medic, reportable medical conditions. Right. Um, I have a handout with them all on. If people, if we can, we can share that with you, uh, because there is a, a website now on the DVLA. You just put in report a medical condition on your Google, on your, your your web search, and it will take you to the right page. Um, unfortunately, it's only for Category One drivers for for car and motorcycle drivers at the minute. Uh, for commercial vehicle drivers it is not possible yet so you still have to do the old method of filling out the form but all the lists are on the government website of medical conditions and driving are the best things to look for um, and you just click on your, your relevant license category and it'll tell you what you have to do so just to, but as an example when we were talking about mandatory conditions before I suffer with high blood pressure I only, I'm only a category one driver but I don't have to report it to the DVLA a HCV driver or a commercial driver, high blood pressure is mandatory reportable, even though it doesn't affect the driving ability, they have to report it. 30% of commercial vehicle drivers suffer with high blood pressure. I've only come across three in the last two years who've reported it to the DVLA. So I would suggest that most 
commercial vehicle drivers who have high blood pressure are driving illegally, which effectively makes their insurance technically not valid at this moment in time. Okay, we've had a very interesting supplementary question on that, which is um, the DVLA website states, please note that you only need to complete this form if you think your condition may affect your safe driving. Depends, some it depends which it is. Um, so at the top of each page on the, on the DVLA site, it'll tell you whether it's a mandatory condition or it is only if it affects your driving ability. And I think that's where the difference is a lot of people will only ask for conditions that affect, that affect driving ability when they complete application forms or they go through insurance renewals. Uh, so think about those things. It's some of them are some of them aren't mandatory, and some of them are just in respect of driving ability. Okay. Um, there have been a number of questions around: Are the slides to be made available? Uh, yes, they will be avail made available, uh, and, and certainly to all those people who've uh, registered on this webinar. Um, another question: um, What are the driving limits in a company's small commercial van getting to and from work? How long or far can they drive before starting work? Bella. Well. I don't, it's the part of the unregulated this is the problem isn't it so it's almost like how far can a company director travel in his in his in his, in his company car um the, the fact is that you can't drive whilst knowingly deprived of adequate sleep or rest you shouldn't drive if you are um impaired in any way or feel impaired in any way but you should certainly have a policy that suggests rest breaks that suggests um taking rests every couple of hours on the road um, and, and that's the minimum, really, that I would I would suggest. So certainly, after driving two hours, you need to have a rest. Um, but it's it's the unregulated industry that is the problem because obviously you don't have the same regulations as HGV drivers. But well, driving to and from work, you'd have to say what are the conditions, what are the the reasons behind it? Is it a normal commute every day? So is it a three-hour drive in the morning to the office and then a three-hour drive home after a full day's work? Should what that employ? Should that employee really be undertaking that job or should they consider staying over during the week, a few nights a week? So they're only driving there on a Monday and driving home on a Friday. It's all about managing the risk. So the driving to and from work doesn't necessarily, for a company car, but is not, there's no legislation there. It doesn't come into the, how much driving you do in the day. It's what your policy says and your contract of employment says about how many hours you work each day how many hours you're expected to travel each day, if you do travel during the day. But if you're just commuting, it's down to the individual to make sure that their commute is consummate to, the, to what they're doing each day and from a lifestyle. Not it, they should raise it, and of course, and it should be dealt with by the company, so they should then consider it and discuss it with that individual employee um, and then document those discussions um, as, as to what kind of compromise they've come to. It's difficult without knowing the exact ins and outs of that because it is entirely unregulated, which is actually probably the issue. Okay. Um, there had to be a B question in this um, somewhere. So um, will Brexit have any impact on current road safety rule and regulations for driver in the U drivers in the UK, do you believe? Uh... I really don't think Brexit comes into it, if I'm honest. I think it is just, it's an, in, it's, it's, it's an individual issue and it's a company issue that then that goes out to every road user. The last video sums it up really. Could, could you change the way you drive today to make the road safer for one other individual? Um, it really makes no difference. The law is there. What laws we have are going to stay after Brexit. So mm -hmm. it will be a... a a number of years before there are many changes. I don't think it's really down to law, it's down to individuals. It's one of the things I ask as an investigator that to anybody that's killed somebody or been in a catastrophic incident in particular is that the last question I ask them is if you could go to speak to the person you killed or catastrophically maimed 10 seconds before the incident, how would you explain, why, what would you say to them to say why you were driving the way you were driving? And it, it's as simple as that for me because I've never had anybody answer that question to me yet because they're so shocked, one, I'm asking it, and when it comes to an investigation, I will ask any question I see fit uh, to get to the truth. And two, they're too embarrassed to say, 
why they were driving because they, they, it makes them accept full responsibility for what they've done. And I think that's what we have to do from a driving perspective. Because there's so many of us driving, somebody highlighted the, the, the aircraft slide at the very beginning to say that that aircraft that we use, the Boeing Air Max, is being grounded because of the collision, the crashes we had last year. They are so observant to, noted to, to see that. But aviation, marine and rail all have catastrophic independent investigation departments. Transport doesn't because you need a special license to drive a, to pilot a plane. You need a special license to pilot a boat. You need a special license to be a train driver. So you're classed as a professional driver. Most people who drive for work aren't classed as professional drivers. Plus, you don't have driving as part of their daily duties in their contract of employment, which they should do. Just something, uh, them, isn't it? it's just something we all do, especially if we're not talking about the commercial vehicles, which actually most of us are not. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Okay. Um, where do you both sit with reporting to the police if one of your employees' drug alcohol tests come back positive? Would you or would you not? Well, you you have to do that. You if if, if they if they have broken the law in any way, um, and and certainly they would have to go through discipl disciplinary within the company. Um, but if they've done something and whilst they were driving, I, th I think that's absolutely morally and legally. I think that's something that we would have to do. From a commercial vehicle perspective, a driver failing the drugs or alcohol test would have to be automatically reported to the traffic commissioner for driver conduct hearing. Uh, and to have the license taken away and suspended. So the, there are legal reasons for doing it. Um, if it's just a, face, a case of a failure of a drug test in the office uh, for a class one driver, category one driver, that's something between the company and the office. However, that said, I have seen many incidents where an employer has failed an internal drugs test being told to go off the premises and being allowed to drive home. Mm. I think that's the biggest, that's the bigger issue. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very good point. Um, can a drink drug policy be targeted at specific groups of employees? We have had resistance due to concerns over being seen to be singling out specific groups of employees and possible grievances. Oh. It, de it depends what groups you're talking about, but, it, but ultimately, if those groups are because those people drive for a living or drive dr or have a, have a company vehicle or a vehicle that belongs to the company, then I can't see how there can be any dis discrimination there. Of course, it should be targeted to the people who drive for, for, for company purposes. Um, but of course, it, I, I mean, I don't know in what context there, but um, I can't see any issue with, with targeting. I think probably the, simpl the simplest question there is, if you have a drug and alcohol policy, it applies across the whole company, regardless of what, what you're employed to do. So office staff should undergo the same drug testing regime as anybody going out to drive a vehicle as well. And then it's the easiest way around it. But, um, but there would be a general policy anyway, I would have thought, if mm. you could implement what it would be a company-wide policy. Um, but obviously it's, it, it's, I, I guess the people that drive for the company are, are going to feel as though that applies far more to them than somebody who's, who, who doesn't. But, um, but it should be company wide. It should be, shouldn't be so focused anyway. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're going to have to draw it to a close there and having uh, make that the, the last question. So um, we are, I know we've got a lot of other questions still um, on, on the board, um, which we will um, get back to people on. Um, it just remains for me and, and Andrew to both thank you, Charlotte and Andrew, for uh, really helpful webinars, some fantastic engaging videos, and certainly a lot of food for thought. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat>